Thank you, Tim, for that very warm introduction. I'm glad you're here to talk about June 26th, a date which will live in infamy. <clears throat> Two years ago, the United States Supreme Court had a crescendo moment, if you will, with regard to the institution of marriage. Two cases, one about Proposition 8, the marriage amendment in the state of California, and the Defense of Marriage Act, otherwise known as DOMA, made their way to the United States Supreme Court. The speculation was far and wide that the United States Supreme Court would settle the question of same-sex marriage once and for all. It did anything but that. The proponents defending California's marriage amendment were kicked out of court, saying that we did not have the standing or the right to be in court to defend that amendment. And Windsor, the DOMA opinion, became the third of a trifecta of opinions written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, which elevated what many call gay rights in this country, invalidating the Federal Defense of Marriage Act and saying that the federal government did not have the right to define a term that Congress used in over 1,100 places in federal law. In that opinion, he cited that the states have the inherent right to define the marriage relationship but must respect the constitutional rights of persons, citing the Loving Against Virginia case, a 1967 case which struck down Virginia's anti-miscegenation laws. What do we do with this confusing result? Well, I know what our opponents did. They launched a unprecedented nationwide campaign, filing lawsuits in almost every jurisdiction in the country, every jurisdiction that, not, that did not embrace same-sex marriage, saturating the courts with demands for same-sex marriage. And of course, the federal courts were more than willing to oblige their demands. Until we got to the Sixth Circuit, Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky, and the Sixth Circuit dared to rebut same-sex marriage, stand for the truth of marriage, and then the United States Supreme Court chose to review the Sixth Circuit cases. As we lay the framework, and it asked these two questions, the United States Supreme Court did, whether the 14th Amendment requires states to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and in the alternative and in addition, whether the 14th Amendment requires states to recognize same-sex marriages for other states. And as we now know, the Supreme Court answered both of those questions on June 26th in a five to four opinion with all four dissenting justices writing dissenting opinions. The Supreme Court answered both of these questions for the entirety of the United States and all U.S. territories, finding that state marriage laws that uphold one man and one woman marriage the diversity of the sexes and the beauty of men and women in a timeless institution are in fact now unconstitutionals. So we're going to take a look at this morning with a wonderful, very distinguished panel at what the court did and did not do and what it means for the road ahead. So let me briefly introduce our panelists. On your far right is my boss, Jim Campbell, the leader of our Center for Marriage and Family. Jim clerked for the Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit, Alice, Batch, Alice Batchelder, is a ADF Blackstone Fellow, met his wife in the uh, Blackstone program, which is a kind of a common occurrence these days. Jim argued the Oklahoma marriage case before the Tenth Circuit uh, <clears throat> and has been involved in marriage litigation uh, the same, time, same amount of time at ADF as I have. Jim uh, showed up at ADF just a few months after I did. In the middle, Jordan Lawrence, AKA Captain Adrenaline, as we call him. Jordan is one of the very first in-house Alliance Defending Freedom attorneys. And Jordan argued the Southworth case before the United States Supreme Court in the year 2000. And Jordan most recently is probably best known for being lead counsel on our New Mexico photographer, Elaine Photography case, and defending the Bronx household of faith in a 20 year battle for religious freedom in New York City. And then we have, to, the, to, my, to my immediate left, Gary McCaleb. Say hello, Gary. Hello. All right. <laughs> Gary will be using his happy voice today, as he always does. <laughs> How do you describe and introduce Gary McCaleb? Well, if you've all seen the movie Gladiator, Gary is to ADF what Maximus is to the Roman army. He is our chief solicitor. 
He is the tip of the spear. Everything that ADF does from a legal standpoint at some level goes through Gary's office. The growth of the ADF legal team uh, long before I got here was largely at Gary's hands and the buck stops with him unless it stops with Alan. So we have a wonderful panel for you this morning and Gary, let's start with you. In the opinion, Justice Kennedy says this, Constitutional liberties extend to certain personal choices central to individual dignity and autonomy, including intimate choices that define personal identity and beliefs. How big in this opinion from the Supreme Court is this theme of individual autonomy? It is big. In a sense, I think it's the beginning and the end, and it certainly preceded it. The idea of self-autonomy, I think, is... Um, kind of pulls back the veil on this decision. A couple of years ago, we took a number of the brighter folks in the legal team, and I tagged along with them, uh, to go out and do some strategic planning. And we sat down and we talked about the nature of man and the nature of law. And being kind of geeky folks at some level, we actually drew a four-quadrant diagram. And on one axis, we put law, on the other axis, we put the nature of man. And the good end of law is the natural law system. The bad end of law is pure positive law, man's law uh, driving the legal culture. On the mankind end, the proper place for mankind to be is to understand your inherent dignity as a specially created being in the eyes of God. The bad end is exactly what you heard here in this opinion, radical personal autonomy, self-defined dignity, or worse, state-granted dignity. And when you play those two axes out one against the other, when you follow up to the best law, the natural law, you go out toward God-defined dignity, that's the realm we find societies living in true freedom and true liberty, ordered liberty, if you will. But when you go the opposite way, when you drive the law toward a pure man-made positive law system, and you drive your understanding of mankind into self-defined dignity, radical autonomy, which is the essence of Justice Kennedy's reasoning, what we characterize that realm is, is hedonistic tyranny. A, a worldview where the predominant desire is simply hedonism, and to get to that end, you need to be tyrannical. And what I mean by tyrannical is what you will see playing out from this decision, which is the sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination laws, and the use of those laws to systematically suppress any Christian voice in the public square, and they'll go beyond that. So the radical personal autonomy is a mouthful, but it boils down to a longing for pure hedonism. And I think the most important takeaway from that is an understanding as a movement, as an individual as well, that this brutal battle that we've seen since the 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, when the homosexual left started this fight, has not been a battle to gain gay marriage. It is a battle to destroy marriage. And if you think about radical autonomy, self-identifying, self-defining my existence, that plays directly into a culture that cannot sustain marriage as a normative institution. It is an institution that cares only about one thing, me, Captain Eeyore. It, Jordan, did, did, the court, did the court provide any guideposts on what individual autonomy means? Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it try to cabin it at all, or is I, it just I, wide open? I think it's a bait and switch. And the, 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 uh, the big quote from the opinion, this is from page 12 of the majority, the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent to the concept of an individual autonomy. A societal system of marriage, sex, and family built on a concept of individual autonomy is basically a Ponzi scheme. And so a Ponzi scheme is, you know, the first investors get money, and then the later investors are left holding the bag. So a man walking out on his wife for another woman, abandoning his wife and children, is exercising a right to personal choice regarding marriage that is inherent to the concept of individual autonomy. A guy who picks up 
a man or a woman at a bar and has a one night stand with them and then you know forgets their name and leaves the next morning is exercising a right to personal choice regarding marriage that is inherent to the concept of individual autonomy that uh, uh, we are this to me is one of the huge flaws in the decision and it's just gonna this is an unsustainable system over time now it may take 50 or 100 years to say boy maybe those traditionalists were right because what they're basically saying is something akin to saying like, what two, pers uh, what two private individuals do in the privacy of their own home with nuclear energy is no business of ours and, and the government shouldn't regulate it or whatever. And they're, they're just not really thinking through what they're dealing with of all the carnage that's gonna come. And uh, uh, societies have basically developed marriage as a public institution to uh, you know, as the containment containers for the nuclear energy, so we can cure cancer and light cities. But what they're saying is is just anarchy. I think when it comes to the marriage, that, that, it's actually probably not a, a, an unapt analogy in that we know that that sex and procreation is one of the most powerful forces That's in right. nature. Uh, in that regard, so how did we get here? I mean, the, does the Supreme Court? Uh, explain how they identify fundamental rights and, and how did they get to the point of identifying this particular fundamental right, Jim? Well, what the Supreme Court did is really a seismic shift in its fundamental rights jurisprudence. Up until this point, the Supreme Court over the past few decades has stressed that we look to the history and traditions of our nation when determining what fundamental rights exist. So it specifically laid out a two-prong test. The first prong is to carefully identify, carefully describe the right at issue, and then second, determine whether that right is deeply rooted in the history and traditions of our nation. The Supreme Court very clearly established that test in a case called Glucksburg that was decided in the 90s, and one of the joining justices of that opinion was Justice Anthony Kennedy. Well, what we saw in the Obergefell decision a week and a half ago is a very radical shift away from that. In fact, the theory of fundamental rights jurisprudence that the concurring opinion talked about in Glucksburg is the standard that now the majority of the Supreme Court has picked up. And what is that standard? Well, it's the standard that justices must exercise their reasoned judgment in determining what fundamental rights exist within the United States Constitution. It doesn't take much imagination to understand that that gives an immense amount of unfettered authority to federal court uh, ju judges and justices to determine what, in fact, the Constitution should protect. And that is a very dangerous precedent, not only for marriage, but also in other arenas as well. So, so when we're talking about imagination within the dynamic of reasoned judgment, um, let's talk about one of the historical slippery slope arguments, Jordan. Uh, those who have defended marriage as one man and one woman have contended for a very long time that if we redefine marriage to include same-sex marriage, what's to stop the embrace of polygamy and plural marriage? Jordan, does this opinion speak to that? It, it, does this opinion cabin that dynamic, or are we extra concerned now about the next step? Well, the, uh, uh, there, there's the main part of Kennedy's opinion, and then he kind of throws in these little, uh, uh, like, implicit rebukes to certain arguments. So he basically says polygamy is not going to happen because he talks about two people on several occasions. And, and because that's been decreed from on high, it's limited to all of that. Uh, but uh, I just want to read from John Roberts' uh, opinion. And let me just say this. I've known John Roberts. I first met him in 1989 when he was working at the Department of Justice. And I've worked on a number of cases with him and, and just have been his friend in D.C. for a, a while. And um, I can just tell you the opinion that he wrote, the dissenting opinion, this was the first time he ever read a, read a dissent from the, the bench. And I was in the courtroom when he did it. And I was kind of curious, is he going to go soft or is he going to really stand true? And, and I was gratified that my friend uh, showed the good stewardship of his office of Chief Justice of the United States to read his first dissenting opinion ever from the bench on this case. And I'll just tell you, the thing is, you know, Scalia can be volcanic, and you know when he's being the Old Testament prophet. Uh, 
John Roberts is much more restrained. This is John Roberts going volcanic in, in the thing. And just to read what he said about the polygamy deal to show how there's basically no restraint. Although the majority randomly inserts the ad, uh, adjective two in various places, it offers no reason at all why two, the two-person element of the core definition of marriage may be preserved while the man-woman element may not. Indeed, from the standpoint of history and tradition, a leap from opposite sex marriage to same sex marriage is much greater than a leap from a two person union to plural unions, which have deep roots in many cultures around the world. I mean, even in the United States with the, polyg uh, with the Mormon polygamist. Uh, if the majority is willing to take the big leap on same sex marriage, it is hard to see how it can say no to the shorter run, uh, to the shorter one. And I think he's exactly right with that. What I think is, it's not only that, but I think the concept of radical self-autonomy, it's all about my happiness and I can uh, hurt other people because the prime directive is for me to be happy, is that people are just gonna stop getting married. And that's what's happening in Europe and that uh, Ryan and Sharif were talking about that. That the regular people can intuit that this concept of self-autonomy means I don't have to lay down my life for others. If it makes me unhappy, Oh, wow, you know, that, that would be violating the prime directive. So why get married? There's no need for that. So I think the polygamy is definitely going to happen, but I think we're going to have way more unmarried cohabitation, children being raised without that, and Kennedy does not seem to be concerned about their dignity. And if I can pull us down a little bit to where a lot of you live as, as general practitioners, maybe solos that dwell in family law a lot, uh, moving away from the constitutional ethereal realms, it was such a huge leap to, to manufacture this novel right to same-sex marriage. The proponents of polygamy have a lot stronger argument just in plain old family law. There are jurisdictions that have recognized polygamous marriages for limited purposes, typically in property settlements. You have someone from a foreign country, they come over with multiple wives, they live peacefully, and then it comes apart. So they've got some grit and, and traction already, just in basic family law. They're advancing this. It's already been played out in Canada, fortunately a win there. But if anyone thinks polygamy is not in the tailwinds, uh, they're actually right. It's in front of the decision and it's gonna come full force on us. In Austin, can I say one other thing? The, uh, the Federalist, which is a publication, we have a number of other people here in the Communicators Tract, which is an excellent publication reprinted and has an article from kind of a hyper libertarian uh, newspaper reporter woman from Asheville, North Carolina, who's into polyamory. And it's basically, it, it takes this concept of individual autonomy so strong, she's basically saying that there should be no institution of marriage at all. And that you can't have total self autonomy if you can only uh, achieve uh, you know, having a, a partner or a multiple partners through a legal institution of marriage. So it's not marriage equality, we're talking about marriage obliteration, marriage annihilation. And, and it's, it's an eye-opening article, it's totally written by a heterosexual perspective and I, I recommend that you read it to, to see the sobering uh, uh, extremes that this whole concept of self-autonomy can go to. All right, so we've looked at, <laughs> what the opinion does, and some of the negatives associated with it. Let's look on the brighter side. Jim, could this opinion have been worse? <laughs> it, it, it certainly could have been worse. It could have been much worse. Uh, that's not to say it's not bad, but um, there were a couple theories that the petitioners put forth that the court decided not to adopt. And, and I'll highlight some of those because I do think that some of those could have been more dangerous for religious liberty and for the future of, uh, of many of the other issues that we care about. Uh, one of the arguments is that the marriage law should have fallen because they were irrational and they were motivated by nothing more than animus. Now, the court didn't come out and say that. I think some of the dissents do a good job of pointing out that the implication of what a lot of what the Supreme Court majority said is in fact painting the people who support these laws as being motivated by an attempt to demean and otherwise disparage same-sex couples. But having said that, the court did not expressly say that, and that's a good thing. One of the other arguments that our opponents have repeatedly put forth in cases like these is the argument that sexual orientation should be a new suspect class entitled to 
special constitutional protection. And the court did not adopt that argument. This is about the third or fourth time recently that argument has been raised and the court has time and time again declined to adopt it. That is good as well for many of the future cases that we'll litigate. Do you want to comment, Jim, too, about how Kennedy kind of flirts with that argument a bit and, and kind of lifts his judicial robe tantalizingly to that point, though? <laughs> It did, what? You didn't give him much of a choice, did you, Jordan? <laughs> I believe what uh, Jordan is referring to in a very colorful way is um, a couple portions of the decision where Justice Kennedy talks about the immutability of sexual orientation. And he does it on two, two places in the opinion on page four and on page eight. So what he's doing there is he's, coming, he's at least strongly implying that a person's sexual orientation is an immutable feature of themselves, and therefore I think he's giving a little bit of a push to future arguments in, in cases that, that might ask for a suspect class uh, status to be granted on the basis of sexual orientation. So there is, some, um, there, there is some discussion on that issue that isn't helpful, but the court did not come right out and declare a new suspect class. So uh, Kennedy didn't charge everybody who believes in marriage as having animus. Uh, he actually, in addition to that, gives a couple tips of the hat, if you will, to uh, people who view marriage through a religious prism. Justice Alito but said in response to this, and I want to get, Jordan, your first year response to this. Justice Alito said, I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such. Jordan, is he overreacting? No, no I do not think that he is. And um, the... And, and there's been a lot of sober assessments about, you know, are uh, Christian colleges going to lose their accreditation or their tax exempt status? And I don't necessarily want to go through all of that, but just to say that we have borne the war wounds. My, my colleague here, Jim, and I were the, from the day one in the Elaine photography case in New Mexico, fought that all the way to the bitter end. At, uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court when they denied review a little over a year ago, and I think it was like seven years of litigation. And, and we, we bear the scars with pride. And I, I just want to make a point that it might be, is, if there's any optimism to this, and I could be wrong, but I just think this is something to consider. I think in about, you know, about 10 years ago, five years ago, many people began to adopt in their minds that there was a grand compromise on the whole same set, you know, kind of the vast middle of, of the U.S., that we are going to legalize same-sex marriage and then protect the right of conscience of religious institutions, people with convictions against it, not force people to participate in ceremonies, not force them to express ideas on marriage that they didn't want. Now, there was a minority of the zealots who wanted uh, we want same-sex marriage, and then we want to have this uh, reign of terror against all the dissidents and publicly uh, you know, punish them and ostracize them, and like Brendan Eich and you know, Elaine Photography and all of that. But there is a, there's a strategy of warfare that Jesus expresses in the Gospels that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think this issue divides the house supporting same-sex marriage. That they're the zealots that want to crucify all the dissidents, and then there's a lot more people that want to have a live and let live. And I think that we now are in unexplored territory, both on how far are they going to go, but I think the zealots are going to be restrained by people who are going to say, look, you got same-sex marriage. Leave these other people alone. I think they're in danger of overreaching, of looking like bullies, and that it's not going to, and, and the analogy that this is just like the segregated lunch counter guys and, and all of this, I just think people are not buying the analogy. And we, even when you have Kennedy saying things like, um, uh, this is on uh, page 19 of his decision, many who deem same-sex marriage to be wrong reach that conclusion based on decent and honorable religious or philosophical premises, and neither they nor their beliefs are disparaged here. 
well, that does not play, that does not play well with they're all bigots and they must be uh, uh, crucified and ostracized. So I think many of these cases are going to start turning around. Jim has won with the T-shirts in Kentucky. The first victory we've gotten, my protege, I'm just so proud of him, like Yoda and, you know, the, the Luke Skywalker here. And, and, and may, it, may he win all the way to the Kentucky Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. Baronel, I think the higher courts are going to start treating her differently, uh, the florist from Washington State, because of this change thing about they've won their right to marriage, stop bullying the people who disagree with you. If I can follow up on what Jordan's saying, I, I agree exactly with what he's brought to the table, and we should have a tremendous amount of hope going forward that we can protect the rights of conscience and keep the door open for the gospel. I think also, and I'm glad you said warfare, that allows me to use a military analogy. I fought the Cold War and we won. Um, <laughs> We also won this other event in ancient history called World War II. What we did was profoundly wise after that. We recognized that what precipitated World War II was not managing the victory of World War I. So when he won War II, we did something called the Marshall Plan and intentionally restored a functional Europe. I want you to think in terms of what the opposition is now doing. They have not won this victory and said, oh boy, we won World War I. They understand they have won a World War II victory here. They have their own Marshall Plan, and that Marshall Plan is what I mentioned earlier. It's this notion of coming in and erecting a systematic system of non-discrimination laws with which they will be suppressing and attacking the hands-on originals, the baronels, anyone who dares speak publicly through thought, word, or deed will be attacked and they will try to suppress it. It is going to be a difficult and challenging fight. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you're here. That's we right. need your help. That's right. The last point I would make on that is um, look to the future. We have to understand this decision, but they are publishing their strategy openly now in Time Magazine and elsewhere. They published in the 1980s in the book After the Ball as Christians, as prudent folks, of people of Issachar, we need to be reading those opposition documents and getting ahead of those. I'm happy to say we've got some plans, not all of which can be announced from this podium. Uh, but think of what they're doing next, not of what they just did, because that's where we need to go and, and counter what they're doing next. And of course, beyond public accommodations, the Baronel Stutzmans of the world, uh, there are others who are really more directly in front of the firing squad, like clerks who issue marriage licenses, those charged with solemnizing uh, marriages. Th this struggle is actually a little bit more broad because uh, there's a lot of points of intersection, and we're, of course, committed as an organization to defending all of them. Let's, let's move from the nitty-gritty of trench warfare and religious liberty lamifications to uh, the ivory tower for just a moment and look at the role of the courts separation of powers, our system of government, and how what happened in this opinion fits within the ideal uh, of what our Constitution uh, is supposed to be. Jim, you want to take a stab at looking at the role of the courts and how this opinion fits within that? One thing that a lot of us tend to forget, I know I certainly do, is that one of our most profound fundamental rights that all of us share in common is the right to go to the polls and enact laws. It's the right to ensure that we as free people can vote our conscience and can vote to put in place laws that reflect a view of society that we support and that we want to, to, to see come to fruition. And that, that right's been taken from all of us. It's been taken not only from, from us in this room, it's been taken from uh, the same-sex marriage supporters. And that, that's a right that uh, is, is something that's very pr precious, and it's not a right that is opposed to individual freedom. It is a part of individual freedom. It is a primary part of ensuring that we all are free people and that as part of a functioning democracy, we can vote for laws and policies that we support. So th that, that's a very important point, and that was something that a lot of the dissenting justices talked about. Specifically, the Chief Justice focused a lot on this, and in his, in his concluding words, he <coughs> said, for those of you who support same-sex marriage, and this is a paraphrase, you can celebrate this decision, but don't celebrate the Constitution because it had nothing to do with it. 
Jordan, let's, I want you to respond to a corollary to the, this point and look at one year ago. One year ago, the Supreme Court decided a case called Shooty. The Michigan voters in that particular case voted to prohibit race-based classifications for their university and higher education system. So they're voting on the most, arguably the most divisive, sensitive issue That's in right. the history of our country, race relations, and, and in a sense, removing affirmative action from their state. The Supreme Court reviewed this and Justice Anthony Kennedy said, the people are entitled to decide this. We are not to presume that any topic is too sensitive for democracy, and the citizens are entitled to try to shape the course of their own times. These are his words. How do you square what the Supreme Court did one year ago on a race case with this, the, the complete opposite of letting the people decide? I think it is arrogantly giving into the temptation to use judicial power to do what's best. So if, if you think about any controversial question, it has both a public policy dimension and a constitutional dimension. So if you take you know, the death penalty or prayer in school or whether we should have sodomy laws or whether we should have legalized same-sex marriage or uh, you know, uh, should we have gun control laws or not, the public policy question asks, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? And the people, the legislators decide that. The constitutional dimension is much narrower that simply says, does the Constitution permit the lawmakers and the people to make the decision that they made on prayer in school or the death penalty or same-sex marriage or whatever? And uh, a lot of the discussion is pointing out that <clears throat> these issues are left to the people. Now, the, the response of if Kennedy and the four uh, in the majority, they say, well, the Constitution protects this, it removes this power, from uh, the people to do. And I just think at a very general level, it is true that the Constitution removes from decisions from the people and the lawmakers. So they can't, uh, th they can't uh, uh, change contracts. They can't, and say so you don't have to fulfill your contracts. They can't bring back slavery and stuff like this. But there's so many expansive hoops that the majority jumps through to get to the point where, uh, uh, we, we have to enforce these constitutional rights. And then they, they just assume that if we're going to have an expansion of liberty, it's not the people or the legislatures that do that, it's the judges sitting like ascended masters on some, you know, because they're like demigods or archangels that are smarter than mere humans and that sort of thing. And, you know, when I would go out and do debates and they'd say, well, you know, the Constitution is meant to bar the, you know, the kind of the, the mob mentality of the majority. Well, the majority passed the Constitution. It was not handed down on Mount Sinai. And, and, and so that, that, that the majority is capable, the way you're saying, of coming to right decisions on this. And I just think we have basically an unrestrained judiciary that they, by, because they mush together now the public policy dimension of a question with a constitutional question. So it's because five justices think this is a good idea as public policy, it's now a constitutional right or a requirement of the Constitution. And, and that's, that's being ruled by elitist, by non-elected elitist. And I'd also add to that, um, the reason they got away with that, one of the reasons they got away with that is almost astoundingly simple. And I'd like to announce that I'm, I'm gonna start a GoFundMe account to buy a copy of Black's Law Dictionary for the Supreme Court. They seem to have lost you three with words. Better earlier edition, Gary. The, the earlier editions are probably going to be more orthodox for uh, you. We'll go with an earlier edition <laughs> for them. But they lost three words, and this is very, very frustrating. As someone who has litigated this stuff virtually my entire career and actually left a prior career directly to confront this in the 1990s, um, the word invidious has escaped the discussion. For those of you who lived through the, the racial discrimination area, they talked about invidious discrimination. Irrational discrimination is what's wrong. Discrimination standing alone is not a bad thing. You discriminate every time you go out to the buffet line, guys. Losing that word enabled a great deal of judicial uh, liberty that is not properly theirs to exercise. The other thing they did, and this I think was extremely frustrating for the advocates on our side, 
is they lost the word similarly situated, similarly situated in respect to the equal protection arguments. Right. No one seriously asked if a same-sex couple contra or compared to a, a mixed-sex couple is really similarly situated in respect to marriage. And when you ask that question, you really end the inquiry right there. My point is the opposition, through very <coughs> intentional briefing approaches and controlling the discussion in court, eliminated three words that were extremely dangerous to their position, and because of that, enabled a Supreme Court to wander into a universe that literally does not exist in the American system. Let's go back to opinion substance and the topic of what I'll call gender diversity. Over 50 years ago, the Supreme Court first said these words, the two sexes are not fungible. The subtle interplay of one upon the other is among the imponderables. How did this opinion address that prior precedent and the object of marriage to bring together the two halves of humanity and celebrate the diversity of the sexes? And I'll just throw that at the panel generally, anybody who wants to take a stab at that. How did the Supreme Court wrestle with sex diversity and the beauty of men and women? Well, that one's easy, they ignored it. Um, <laughs> the court didn't talk about that. That was an issue that um, a lot of amicus briefs raised. Uh, I think Sharif and Ryan talked about this a little bit at the last, at the last hour. We as a movement are coming to a place where we're, we're getting better arguments by every month. We're, we're getting better spokespeople every month. And I think our arguments on the difference between men and women, the importance of both a father figure and a mother figure, I think all of those arguments are getting better. Um, what arguments are even better than those are the importance of biological connectedness, the importance of a kid being able to know and be raised by his or her own mother and own father whenever possible. All those arguments were put forth before the court. There's good, solid social science evidence to support that, and the court ignored it all. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, the we challenge these uh, and and oppose these SOGI laws, the sexual orientation and gender identity. And I just want you to to point out the obvious that they go hand in hand. I should be able to pick uh, this right to <clears throat> individual autonomy means I can pick whomever I want, regardless of gender, as a marriage partner or a sex partner, and that I, I determine myself what is my gender. I mean, it is radical self-autonomy that's like exalting self as deity. It's, it's the idol of self being worshiped here. And I, I just think that, you know, we're talking about this at a big cosmic level, that uh, I mean, you may think this is funny, but when I, when I talked about this earlier this summer at Blackstone, I didn't shave for two days because I just want to say, I'm a man, I've got stubble, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, the women, you know, you think about how you dress, like I am, I am created in the image of God as a man or a woman. And I, I you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody out in the, the hall who just got married a couple uh, months ago. And I was thinking, and we, we were talking about how getting married according to what the Bible says, is now a radical fist of defiance against this prevailing ascendant orthodoxy that says everybody is just bland Mr. Potato Head with removable parts, you know, and, and then you, you know, <laughs> mate with as many Mr. or Miss Potato Heads that you want. And, and, and I think that, there's, that we've got to start in our own lives thinking, how do we hope to hold the institution of marriage and how do we demonstrate that maleness and femaleness is not an artificial, arbitrary, cultural construct, but is something that is embedded in the creation and comes from the very nature of the Trinity. We're going to open this up for questions in uh, just a couple minutes. So just a reminder, if you do have questions, please uh, submit them. I've received a lot of questions from the, those of you thus far, and we're going to get to those in a moment. Gary, before we do that, though, I want to talk about our status. And when I say our, I'm talking about people who believe that marriage is one man and one woman, 
and are disturbed by this decision and want to see a marriage culture restored. Are we marriage defenders currently in the same position that pro-lifers were in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was decided? In some ways we are. Obviously we have an extremely adverse and powerful Supreme Court decision against us and that's never really a comfortable place to be. But I think in a lot of senses we are so far ahead of the power curve compared to where we were in 1973. And a large part is what's in this room. Uh, one of the questions I frequently get is, what's the alliance? And when I'm talking to someone like you folks in this room, my usual answer is, well, I'll tell you how to figure out what the alliance is. When you crawl out of bed in the morning and walk in there to brush your teeth, look in the mirror, smile wide and say, well, hello, alliance. You are the alliance. <laughs> and you're joined by thousands of others who are working in tandem with us, whether you came through a formal ADF program like this or you've come to the movement as a Christian motivated by a faith and an understanding of the gospel, we have a phenomenal alliance, and it's one that runs much more deeper than the law. I was thinking while Jordan was talking of the experience of Dr. Mark Regneris at UT Austin, a good and blessed gentleman who has studied human sexuality as a sociologist. He comes out with a study, which happens to not be cited in this decision, oddly enough, even though it is the best research in America on family structures, which somewhat unsurprisingly concluded that a family structure of a man and a woman married, a durable marriage with biological children, produces phenomenally good sociological results. The adoptive family with the same mom-dad structure is the next best. When you go into same-sex relationships, the social outcomes are frankly disastrous for society with almost every standard measure. He no sooner announced that than he was attacked with an ethics charge. It wasn't even enough time for the opposition to read his research, let alone understand it, but they thought it was unethical for him to suggest that result. My point is, our alliance goes far outside this room, far outside the direct efforts of ADF as an organization. We have folks like Mark Regneris and a multitude of disciplines who have understood and engaged this fight in a way we never have before. The other thing we've got and I hope if you have the opportunity to speak to one of these clients that you've seen, you thank them from the bottom of your hearts. I often compare lawyers to helicopters because I've been around helicopters for a while, and they're awesome. It doesn't matter what's going on outside. A helicopter shows up, the turbines are screaming, the blades are thwapping, it's blowing hot air everywhere. It's drama. It's an attorney. And it's absolutely useless unless it has a payload. And those clients are our good and blessed payload, allow us to advocate in the, advocate in the public sphere, sphere. My point is, we used to go to the public with folks like me and talk about the law and summary judgment and go on Fox News. And folks, you know, it, it didn't work too well. Now we go to the public with stories like Baronell and folks are beginning to understand our story. And it's not only our side understanding it, it's the third party commentators, the op-eds, the shapers of opinion. And we should understand clearly, we can win in the Supreme Court. We won the Dale decision in the Supreme Court from the Boy Scouts and what happened? Because of the culture, the Boy Scouts welcomed a perverse view of sexuality into their organization and deemed it, quote, morally straight, unquote. We win these things in the court, we lose them in the culture, we must engage in the culture. And the good and blessed news is, compared to Roe v. Wade, we are light years ahead of the curve on that. Light years to go, but in tremendously good, tremendously good position to fight this fight. You know, and I, I just want to add one point to this. If you're thinking, wow, I would love for even one opportunity to be on Fox News to talk about this, but here I am, I'm, you know, wherever you, you know, you're in some, you view yourself as in some backwater, uh, tending sheep on some obscure hill in Israel, writing Psalms and you know, like what is the point of that? And, and how can God use that? I want you to understand that God in his sovereignty has given you five loaves and two fishes. They're different for everybody, but we all have our five loaves and our two fishes. 
And the issue is, do the work well in front of you. Be willing to give it to the master. And like, and, and the 5,000 will be fed. And when David came to that hill and saw the challenge of Goliath, then all this stuff he was doing in obscurity made sense. Because he realized, I can take him out with a slingshot before he can get the javelin off at me. And so you've got to be in faith that what you're doing right now has a purpose for greater things. And don't think like you're, th that there's no purpose to what you're doing now. Be faithful in the little and you'll be faithful in the much. Or, or in, yeah. <laughs> or in more simple terms, you don't have to be an Alliance Defending Freedom employee or be working for a ministry to be in the center of God's will or for God to be preparing you for something that he wants you to do and stand. Uh, as I think we were kicked off early this week, you we were told, we believe this is a divine appointment that you are here, That's right. that you are here. Uh, what God has in store, we only can speculate about. Um, let's look at some questions. We have some phenomenal questions that have come in. I appreciate all of you who have submitted questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but uh, there are some really good ones. Jim, uh, let me ask you this. What is the status of Windsor in the wake of Obergefell? Uh, Windsor said that states have the inherent authority to define the marital relation, accepting constitutional rights. The court has now said that same-sex marriage is a constitutional right. So do states still possess any authority over marriage? And if so, where are the lines drawn? Well, the question brings to mind a really nice statement I read from a colleague we, worked, we work with on a lot of these cases. He wrote a, a piece a couple days after the decision came out, and he called it Windsor's Disappearing Inc. And it, 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 has, it has very much disappeared. I, I would say, I mean, the obvious an answer is that According to the Supreme Court, the states can do pretty much anything they want with marriage except affirm it as the union of a man and a woman. So stay tuned to see how much more the court will erode that as it seeks to uh, divine what its reason judgment uh, discloses to it about the Constitution. And when we think about authority over marriage, two things that jump to mind are, are ages of consent, which vary in states, and levels of consanguinity, you know, how close are you in blood relation to get married. Does this... Windsor's disappearing ink, states still possess some authority uh, on one side and individual autonomy on the other side put those things into flux? Windsor expressly talked about the two limitations that you mentioned, age and consanguinity. Um, so I would argue that, that those on, on the authority of Windsor should still survive. I would also argue that laws affirming marriage as the union of two people should still survive. Now, I acknowledge what everyone said, that if you follow the logic of the Obergefell decision, that really all of those laws are, are in, in some jeopardy. But I, I also agree with what Ryan said the last hour, and that is there's going to be carnage left in the wake of every further deviation from the truth about marriage. So we as an organization are committed to defending what remains. And I think that the Supreme Court has given us, well, if, if Obergefell has proven anything to us, it's shown us that logic doesn't necessarily hold the day, hold the, end of, <laughs> hold the cards at the end of the day. Um, so I think we need to continue to argue for what remains, and I think Obergefell has given us enough wiggle room. One example is that the Supreme Court stressed in its opinion that these laws don't harm anyone. They don't harm anyone involved in these, rela I'm sorry, that these relationships that are now being recognized as marriages, that they don't harm anyone. They don't harm anyone in the relationship, and they don't harm third persons. Well, th so that's another window that we can use to argue why further departures from the truth about marriage should not be permitted under Obergefell. Uh, Justice Scalia, I remember quipped that the absence of logic in this opinion is the, uh, uh, similar to the, uh, I forget what the word it was he used, but the uh, admonitions you'll find in a fortune cookie. The aphorisms uh, of a fortune cookie. Exactly. So that, that's there as far as that's concerned. Gary, let me, let me ask you a, a more philosophical question about, or it's not my question, I'm transmitting one here from somebody in the audience. Great question about the role of the church moving forward. Uh, and this revolves around... Uh, getting the state out of the marriage business altogether, the role of the church in continuing to solemnize marriages and sign marriage licenses. Uh, 
where, did the, where are the lines drawn now and how should the church respond in continuing to be involved or not in the governmental institution of marriage? There are discussions on this and there are good and reasoned minds on both sides of the question as to whether we basically withdraw from civil government, have purely religious marriages, and if people within your religious community want the benefits of civil marriage, then you go subject yourself as an individual uh, to the civil marriage system and get your benefits or whatever. The religious marriage stands alone. Um, my perspective is that that risks losing the salt and light we're supposed to be uh, in the culture. The law is a teaching mechanism. Uh, you might notice I'm a, old enough to remember the 1950s. The law taught us a lot about marriage in the 1950s to the extent that my parents as a middle class family, military family, when my dad learned that the neighbor was having a divorce, literally went in the kitchen to tell my mother privately rather than say the divorce word in front of his children. That was a consequence of the teaching effect of the law. And it was a good consequence. Yes, there were marriages that had to be severed, but they were severed for cause, not for whim. And it led to a very different and very healthy culture in that phase of our life. I think the better role going forward is to be mindful that we are in the world. And in my view, we're walking away from our neighbor if we merely pull into our religious community and say we will not engage uh, the broader culture and maintain that role. There's another very, very, very important aspect of this, which again is frustrating because the Supreme Court actually got marriage right in 1877 in a case named Meister v. Moore. Very brief reference, but there's a line in there that says something to the effect of the state can regulate the mode of entry to marriage, but it can't say what marriage is. It was basically saying a state could outlaw common law marriage and require a ceremony so you had a fixed point for administrative purposes to recognize a marriage. My point is, we've got to maintain reality here. Marriage is what marriage is. And I think if we pull in and say, well, there's a civil marriage and a religious marriage and one is a kind of a sham and one isn't, it's a form of dualism that we're teaching our culture we don't want to do. I think the church moving forward needs to do one thing and do it very well to reassert the primacy and goodness of marriage. I was dumbfounded when I read an article the other day, and if my memory serves me, it was a mega church in the, uh, Tennessee claimed about 44,000 participants, and the pastor said, well, our church doesn't have a position on marriage. I read Genesis the other day. God has a position on marriage, and the position is, man and woman joining together for the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying. That's where the church needs to take this narrative and it needs to do it with a passion and a caring heart toward the community. This brings great good to our brothers and sisters whether they believe or not the right notion of marriage and that's the burden of the church. <coughs> Jordan, um, this next one's for you. What did Obergefell do to Roe versus Wade? You know, the pro-life movement has made so many strides. Uh, Americans are, are a majority pro-life, more pro-life, and, and then since Roe versus Wade, a lot of people and even legal scholars speculate it's a matter of time before that's overturned. Did this decision breathe new life? into Roe and, and, and the, uh, the heresy and evils of abortion? I am not absolutely sure, but I would think no in this sense, is that law influences culture, but also culture influences law. And if I think I had to pick, I would rather have the cultural influences. You know, I'd rather write the TV show scripts and the movie scripts and the songs and, and leave the law alone, and the law would follow. Now, I, I, I don't think that that's totally, you know, 100% the relationship. But I think that the culture of life is just too big and too vibrant and too robust to 
you know, let's say that there was a line in the decision that says, oh, and we, uh, we restate how wonderful and powerful Roe v. Wade is with, you know, with this Obergefell decision. I, I just think it would be like, uh, you know, pounding a piece of paper on a telephone pole in a hurricane. It just, it just would, it, it would have, it just would get blown away. Now maybe I overstate that to show the effect of this. And I think the cultural recapturing of this, because uh, Obergefell started with, you know, Hugh Hefner putting out Playboy magazine, the hippies saying uh, free sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that those were earlier expressions of this notion of radical self-autonomy. And now as the church, I just want to piggyback on something Gary was saying, just now I've got to say, look, we are made in the image of God to reflect maleness and femaleness, community and the Trinity. Now you can have, a, and, and getting married is not the only way to cure loneliness. And chastity has to be practiced by everybody, even by married people. I mean, they're, they're in situations uh, where uh, you know one is ill or they're on a trip or something that that self-control is normative and that we all basically uh, deal with this you know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of uh, Anna the prophetess and the end of Luke 2 she was married for seven years she was in her 80s she spent her time praising God and worshiping God in the temple and then she saw the incarnate Christ so she only had the uh, under the law the legal ability to have sex for seven years Yet, she was content in God. And I think that there's something the church can recapture there and teach the culture because it's going to be an empty bag, what they've been sold by Justice Kennedy and the majority. It may take 50 years, it may take 100 years, it may be less than that. But I think in some ways, <clears throat> in a weird way, I'm kind of glad that Obergefell is out of the way now. We're more like the first century church in the book of Acts and we can start saying, okay, you're on the marriage team now? Are you against cohabitation? What about no-fault divorce? What about adultery? And if they start going, uh, 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 I don't want to be like you right-wing fundamentalists, oh, so are you dedicated to the institution of marriage or to the concept of self-autonomy? Because they're not the same thing. I just think we, ha we have an ability to be more bold. And with ADF here and the others, I don't know if we're going to keep us out of jail, if they're going to try to disbar us all. You know what? But we're in this together. We're not as individuals with all of this. And we're going to go down fighting on this. This is our moment in history. I mean, we weren't born 150 years ago or 500 in the future. Here we are today. This is the issue. And I think this is something that we just see in the sovereignty of God. We just put our whole hearts into. And we've got all of us to do it together. And to me, that's very encouraging. Amen. <laughs> We've got time for one more question because we've got a minute left, and, and Jim, this was, is going to you. And the beauties of our governmental structure is that the Supreme Court doesn't actually get the final word. Uh, we saw that in 1858 with the Dred Scott decision constituting, uh, constitutionalizing a right to hold slaves and the response of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Is a constitutional amendment a reasonable response uh, to this decision, and if so, how do we go about doing that? I think it is a reasonable response. I don't think it's one that politically is is available right now, but I think it's something that we certainly can work towards. Um, right now, there are two primary proposals out there. The first is what I call a definitional approach, and that is to define in the federal constitution the definition of marriage as a union between a man and a woman. And then there's what I call the federalism approach, which would simply say that a state, should it choose to do so, has the authority to affirm marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Um, so I think that should be a part of the ongoing discussion. And, and just to conclude, and I think it, it fits with this, with hopefully a high note, a note of encouragement, and that is what we're going to do what we're going to do at Alliance Defending Freedom, what we want to do in partnering with all of you as we move forward in this new world uh, where marriage is redefined as a matter of our constitutional jurisprudence. The first thing is we are going to continue to speak the truth about marriage, and we encourage all of you to do the same. Um, th there's no replacement for winsomely and 
uh, persuasively communicating that truth because ultimately I believe all of us in this room understand that truth prevails so we need to continue to speak that truth in addition to that we need to continue to undermine and limit Obergefell we need to continue to advocate good family-based legislation in the holes that Obergefell left whether that's dealing with um, adoption, whether it's dealing with uh, forms of uh, assisted reproductive technology like commercial surrogacy and anonymous egg and sperm donation, we're going to continue to look for ways to promote good family-friendly laws and public policy. And finally, we're going to defend the right of people to live consistent with the truth about marriage. That's a right that all of us have. It's a right that the Constitution ensures, and it's a right that we at Alliance Defending Freedom are committed to defending. Please join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent presentation.